Hello, this is working. Yes. <laughs> Hello, this is er <clears throat> Eric Rosenberg. Hi, I'm Eric Rosenberg. Uh, I didn't know if it was started or not, so sorry for the confusion. Uh, welcome to uh, another session of uh, AO. Uh, I'm uh, originally from Belgium, live in South Florida, and I've been uh, an entrepreneur most of my life. Started my first business in the late 20s and currently involved in a SaaS company. I also have a podcast called The Business of Meetings because I had a corporate event company for 20 years uh, back in Brussels and work in over 50 countries. And I am delighted uh, to be one of the, the mentor here in the group. Uh, and I have some questions from today. So we are um, going to start immediately. Get into the concrete stuff. Uh, and I have actually two questions from Nancy Lopez. Nancy, if it's okay with you, I'm going to combine both because I believe that uh, the answer uh, actually uh, will concern both of your questions. So the first question you ask is what business sales branding and preparation do I need for my business before I start trying to sell my product to wholesalers? Uh, and the second question is, do I have to choose to sell my product only online direct to consumer? Okay, can I also wholesale as well? And what should I look out for when doing so? Um, and then the background of uh, your question is you make jewelry. You want to sell it online and through other boutiques. What do I need to have ready before I start contracting, contacting them? And also that uh, you say you're struggling with who your ideal customer is. I want to sell direct online, but I also would like to see through wholesalers who then sell to their customers like a retail boutique. What should I take into consideration if I plan to do both? Obviously you have a lot on your plate. So the first thing I would do, um, Nancy, is Google the business model canvas. This is a fantastic tool that's gonna help you uh, synthesize your IDs and have a more concrete um, projection of what is it that you want to be doing. So it's called the Business Model Canvas and it's basically one page with different boxes about your value proposition, your channel of distribution, the different partners you want to be looking at, uh, your cost, revenue, everything you need to think about in one page that make you um, brainstorm a lot on your own or you can uh, bring uh, one or two friends with you. Whatever the business I've been involved, I always use it. I bring some people to reflect on the questions and help me uh, define the business model. So to get into uh, your several question, first of all, wholesale or online. These are two different approach and that one approach can be dangerous for the other. For instance, if you sell uh, to uh, true wholesalers and you sell online and it's the same price that you give to your wholesalers and you go online, then they're not going to be willing uh, to sell your product because they don't have any margin in it. So that, that's the, the very first thing. Uh, but the second thing that I would really encourage you to do is to define this ideal customer. I know you say you're struggling with it. So why don't you reach out to maybe you already have customers? or you have friends that you can talk to that are potential customer, tell them what you're doing, ask them what they think about it, show some of the product that you have already, uh, ask them about the pricing, ask them what they like, uh, ask them what it, it reminds them of, or ask them questions about to define the competition you have. So that's uh, another point of uh, going deep into who are your ideal customer. Uh, and then I think to, clarified your, your thinking about wholesales or online, uh, I would assume that you don't have millions to put on the table to start with. So I would look at the first thing I would look at is how much does it cost you to produce your jewelry? Is it something you do yourself? Uh, are you uh, working with different vendors? Uh, what is your cost of producing one um, of your jewelry? And based on that, uh, what are the different pricing you can adapt and, and, and uh, apply uh, so that you decide where you want to do the margin and how many jewelry you need to sell to be prof profitable from the get-go. That's something that I would definitely do if I was you. 
uh, if I were you, sorry, to, to really look at the pricing and how many sales do you need to have? And then the business, the sales, um, obviously we can speak hours on, on this one. Uh, going back to the business model canvas, you will look, and, and I really encourage you to separate wholesale and online and think about two different businesses and then bring them together and decide what you want to be doing. Take, for instance, uh, Michal Negrin, um, the uh, Israeli designer. I know that her jewelry can be found uh, in uh, different stores. They have their own stores. You can find it in an airport. You can also find it online. So when you look at that and you look at the cost that you have producing and the type of business you want to have, then you can basically answer the question for yourself and what you want to be starting with. Don't start with both at the same time. Pick one, test it for several months, and eventually test the other one if you prefer. But if you look at yourself then, what is it that you like to be doing? Uh, how many hours do you like to be working? What you like to be focusing on? Creating the jewelry, finding client for the jewelry, or maybe you're gonna go into uh, the wholesaler. Whatever you decide, it's what is you like to, to, to spend your time with. And Obviously, how much revenue does it bring to you? So when you look at the business, let's say that you start with um, online. What, what type of website do you need to have? Uh, the branding, do you want to you find your name? You want to find, uh, and I don't know how far you are uh, in, in your business, but one of the questions you're asking about sales and branding, if you don't have a brand, then it's kind of difficult to... Uh, go and see wholesaler that maybe you're competing with other brands or you find wholesaler actually that want to put their brand um, on your product. Those are the questions that you need to answer for yourself before deciding which one you want to be doing. Um, what is your brand? How are you going to uh, promote your brand uh, through social media, uh, through a different uh, network that you have, uh, through influencers that you would know because obviously you don't want to be spending uh, money, especially uh, at the beginning. So there's a lot of question, but that comes back to, to me, the main one. Um, and that's really what I would do uh, if I were you. It's to download this one sheet called Business Model Canvas and start answering all the question in it. That you will get uh, clarity. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would look at, how much does it cost you to produce um, the, the different uh, product you're selling? how many hours, uh, how many people involved. And the third thing, um, going back to um, what, how you want to be distributing, uh, is the cost of distribution, the cost of sending. What if, um, I, I think you were based in Belgium, where I'm from. Uh, if I buy uh, one of your products, I'm in the States, how are you going to, to send it to me? How much is it going to cost? Is there any tax? Uh, what if I don't like it? What about the return? So you see, it's two different ways of distributing uh, your product, two different ways of uh, developing your business, which is why uh, I think it's urgent to wait for a few hours, sit down, define the answers to those questions. Um, and obviously, I'm here and uh, the other mentors as well, follow up questions. But that's really what I, I would start if I was you. Uh, I hope it's helpful and I look forward to hearing about your progress. So next uh, question that I have for uh, today is coming from Morgan Katz, uh, Morgan Denton Katz. And the question is, what strategies do you use to build your network? It's a great question. Um, the business description and background of your question is, uh, I work with companies to help them maintain their season tickets to concert, venues, sports team, etc. I'm very active on LinkedIn, join the club, and in-person networking events, join the club, prior to COVID, but looking for new option to add in. I'm looking for ways you use networking groups or association to develop more relationships or get even more buy-in with large customer. So from what you're saying, um, Morgan, you're also helping companies. So basically you're helping corporation manage their season and even tickets. So about networking, and I'm going to get into that. But the first thing that I would do for any type of business, understand your customers. What are their pain? 
what are their objectives? What are they trying to achieve? What is their competition? What are they trying to work on? And whether it's for networking, live events, whatever it is, this is crucial for you to be able to help them better is to understand what is it that they're trying to achieve. So assuming you've done that, then let's go into the networking. You say you're very active on LinkedIn, so am I. <clears throat> Excuse me. The main part of networking for me is the long term. It's not about the sales and the immediate sales. Uh, and we're talking about live events. I remember um, when I was attending a, a conference uh, with uh, MPI, Meeting Professionals International, I have one person coming to me and she was sent by an hotel and she said, well, uh, how do I get more business here? Because my boss sent me to this conference um, and I have to uh, find three pieces of business. And, and I look at her and said, you might want to go home now. And she said, what? <laughs> I said, yes, this is a long term game. And whatever you sell, it's always based on trust when you're talking with people. And trust doesn't, is not built in, in few uh, seconds. It takes time. So in that particular case, I told her it's better that you, you just play on serendipity, the type of people you're meeting there, have a conversation, don't talk about yourself. So when you are in a networking situation, in a live situation, ask question, have a genuine interest in the person you're talking to. The less you speak about you, the more people will like you. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but that's really what it is. People love to talk about themselves, for one. And for two, how could you help them if you don't know what their issue is, what their objective is? So that's the first thing is to ask a lot of questions uh, and making sure that uh, you understand who they are, what they need, what's important for them in life. The second thing really, it's to maintain the contact, to provide value. And I know it's very buzzword. I want to provide value. Yes. Uh, and then at the end of the sentence, would you want to buy from me? Forget about it. The real value is from the moment that you have a genuine interest in the person, you understand their need, you understand what they're looking for. It's to provide them information that you, you're um, thinking about an article that might interest them. Um, I, I give you a concrete example. I, I have a friend uh, whose son is graduating from uh, Cornell. And I just uh, look online this week. They were talking about a specific networking group that they were creating for the alumni of Cornell University so that they can find jobs and network with people looking for intern or for young recruit. I copy paste the link and I send it to my friend. Um, I do it because it's a friend, but I would do it as well uh, if it's a prospect or a client because I like helping people. So that's really the long term. Now, when you're talking about association, what would you do with association? Volunteer, take responsibilities, help. And you have no idea how much uh, I've volunteered in my life and how much I get out of it. I never know where it's going to come from, who's going to come from. Uh, I like helping people for sure. And in the meantime, all this networking is coming back one day on the other because of the relationship you built. And trust me, when uh, I was a student, networking was not even a word part of my vocabulary. I was involved um, in student organization. One of them is ISEC, which really changed my life. And I was doing it because I love the value, because I, I love being involved. Um, and 20 years later, I realized that I've built uh, an amazing network without even knowing it. So I know there's an intention here, but it's a time constraint. So for your client in ticketings, for your corporate client, uh, obviously they have certain objectives when they invite uh, their customer themselves. Uh, you helping them manage those uh, tickets, uh, those season tickets, it's wonderful. At every step on the way, look at how you can help them help their customer so that you're not just there to provide a service, but you are a trusted partner that have their interest in their mind. Um, then talking about LinkedIn, and I, I will conclude with that um, today, but and I'm sure if you're active on LinkedIn, you've had it as well. I cannot count how many times per day I'm receiving an invite, 
oh, you're such a great person and I've read some of your articles or I read your book or I've listened to your podcast. I'd like to connect with you. And I think that we can mutually uh, um, help each other and uh, with information, blah, blah, blah. Every single time, whatever the approach is that I'm receiving an invite like that and I accept it, I would say 90% of the time. The next thing is I'm receiving <laughs> a message like this when they kind of, excuse my French, vomiting everything about them. This is what we're doing. Now, do you have time next Friday at 10 o'clock or Thursday afternoon at 3 p.m. for a quick call and see how we can help each other? And I almost now want to delete that connection. This is not networking. Imagine that I'm, I'm that you are in your office, like physically in your office, and I open the door, you have never met me, you don't know who I am, and I'm just like talking to you and selling you something. That's the same effect. So what is with LinkedIn, what is with association, look at the long term uh, play, the long term game, try to understand the needs uh, of your customer, try to help them along the way. And I know now it's still a difficult time, although we were talking about reopening, by the way, uh, Freeman, uh, the company Freeman AV came up with um, a, uh, a survey recently that um, about 78% of the people are talking about going back to a live event in the fall and 94% by the winter. So there's a light uh, at the end of the tunnel. There's not a train coming full speed on the other side. Uh, so people will go back, but today and the next month are still going to be uh, difficult for you. Uh, I would suspect, but that's the moment when people are still available in the time, reach out to them, don't sell your service, talk about them, talk about their pain, talk about uh, what they're trying to achieve and ask the question how you can help them and whatever they're telling you, um, write down uh, that. And uh, when you have an article, when you have an idea, whatever it is, or when a connection that can help them, just do it. So look at the long term, uh, try to help people, Ask them question and last but certainly not least, uh, especially when it comes to networking, have a CRM. If you don't have a CRM, just start with an Excel sheet, but write down all the contact that you have because the first one you will remember, but after 80 uh, contact, you might not remember who was the person who was a, a fan of that team or who was that person who told you that their kid was uh, waiting for an answer to go to college and you wanted to see if they were admitted. So. Use a CRM. There's a lot of different CRM out there, uh, but just make use of it. Voila. Um, I was. It was I hope it was um, helpful, uh, Morgan, and um, hopefully uh, you'll keep it posted on the progress you're making. So before going to the next question, I'm going to take a sip of water. Here we go. Next question is from Joe Nugan. I hope I'm pronouncing well your name, Joe. Uh, the question is, what do you suggest as far as paying independent contractors who, are, who I contract to help me facilitate providing my services to my customers? Great question. Um, but let me give you also the background of your question for those who would be listening, because I think they can benefit from it as well. Uh, you own a home inspection business and you're turning away five to eight inspection per week. You're looking to partner with an other inspection company, Solopreneur, who is not as busy so I can make more money while working less. It's a good idea. How do I do the billing, collect from client, then send to other inspection company or have them collect them, they send me a check. So once again, your question, what do you suggest as far as paying independent contractor who I contract to help me facilitate providing my services to my customer. So you're doing the home inspection. Um, I would assume that when you do a home inspection for one customer, unless is um, a real estate investors, that customer is not going to come back to you before several years. And they will refer you as well if they're happy of what we're doing. The other part, obviously, is um, the realtor, the real estate agent that uh, you're working with and that can contract with you and will give you regular business. So when I think about that, my first reaction, if I was in your shoes, was my brand. You want to make sure that you're delivering 
the perfect service. And when I had my corporate event company, I was a year where it was completely crazy. We were all over work and I received an RFP that I decide not to answer. And I call the prospect and I say, listen, I've been willing to work for you for several years. And I know that we're so busy right now. I'm understaffed and I won't be able to give the answer of the RFP that the way I wanted to. Uh, I don't have the time to look for it. And I don't think it, 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 I think it would be a disservice for you. And I just definitely don't want to burn bridges with you, which is why I'm not going to answer the RFP. And guess what? My reaction was very positive and uh, they became a client afterwards. Um, but that to me, the point is your brand is, especially as a solopreneur and entrepreneur, your brand is the most important asset you have. So whoever you're going to partner with, you need to make sure that that person or those persons are delivering the value, are helping their customer the way you would because your brand is uh, on the table. Having said that, regarding paying uh, those contractors um, and uh, the financial flux and the invoicing and everything, you know, it's a little extra work for you, but my point is always to control the finances, to have a view on the finances. And so for me, I would definitely look at invoicing myself, the customer, and then paying uh, the commission or the service to uh, the other contractor, the other solopreneur uh, I would be working with. And I give you another example of something that I put in place uh, for, for my business that give you uh, an idea of what I was doing there. Wherever I work in the world, let's say I, I was bringing uh, a corporate event to uh, Tanzania. Um, I would work with local partner in Tanzania and I would also pay the hotel we were going to use directly, telling the hotel we were going to use that I'm working with this partner locally, so the commission of the hotel should go to that partner, but I'm paying directly the hotel. Why? Because in case anything happened to the local partner, I didn't want to have my money stuck with them and the hotel not pay. So in this particular case, uh, whoever you work with, you want to make sure that the end customer is paying you and then that you're paying uh, the person, the vendor, you're partnering, the solo printer, you're partnering with. Now, in terms of percentage, well, that's really um, up to you, depending on the time you're doing that. Are you looking at a long term and eventually partnering with uh, that solo printer or are you looking at specific few months uh, to work with. So let's say that you invoice 100 for the sake of it. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, obviously you're not paying that solo printer more than 100 uh, and, and hopefully make uh, also um, additional uh, benefit uh, for you uh, because you're bringing the business to that solo printer. So uh, look at uh, what you think would be fair for you, if you were in the opposite uh, situation, if somebody would come to you and you would need the business, uh, how much would you be happy to be paid or how much discount would you give to that person bringing you the business uh, and negotiate then with the solo printer. The most important thing, two most important things. First one, define the pricing before going out because you're going to sell uh, something and you need to make sure that you, you secure your pricing. The second thing, put the things clearly on paper with the uh, solo printer. For instance, if you're working for um, a broker that is giving you record in business for home inspection, you want to make sure that if you're bringing somebody else in the team, that somebody else is not going to go after your client afterwards. So you want to put that uh, and protect yourself in the agreement that they cannot uh, solicit the, the business or even that they cannot work for your customer for at least uh, two, three years because they, you know, they can always play on the words and say, I didn't solicit. They reach out to me and say, no, make it very clear. So all those points um, need to be agreed with the, the other solopreneur or the other company, the other vendors you're going to partner with uh, for your home inspections. And also look at um, maybe different uh, opportunities that they have, different uh, capabilities that they have, uh, different uh, region or people that they know so that you can also think about uh, expanding your business. Um, but 
make sure that everything is in the contract and make sure that you're controlling the finances, you're the person invoicing the customer and you're the person, uh, you're the organization who's paying the vendors and not the other way around. That at least what I would do. Hope it's helpful. And uh, let, let us uh, know about how you're doing and if you have any other question. Okay, Joe, hope it's helpful for you. Another sip of water. And we go to the next question. I have two more questions for today. And this one is coming from Nicole Batiste. And Nicole is asking, is there a checklist for lack of a better word? I can use to make sure I'm covering all bases as I start a partnership with complementary business. We just um, a little bit spoke about that, but uh, definitely gonna answer that question. It's a great question, a very important question, Nicole. Um, so your background and the business description, uh, you are a life habit strategist and you're helping clients create better habits that lead to permanent weight loss. I think I need that. Uh, better eating habits, better morning and evening routines, stress and anxiety reduction, better sense of self and trust. I'm partnering with a local fitness person as I do not have a fitness component to my program. And we're creating a separate, separate business name and we'll conduct workshops and programs that incorporate both of our services. That means payment could either go to each of us separately uh, for joint gig, or we can create a separate PayPal or something for joint payment. I know there are a bunch of legal things to consider. Just want a place to start. Um, good, Nicole, if you're listening to uh, my answer, uh, the, the question just before uh, that I answered Joe Nugan, I think you can uh, definitely get some uh, additional uh, feedback here. But let's look at what you're doing. You're going to partner with somebody who's not doing what you're doing, but is doing something complementary, which is great. That means that you can both bring additional business to each other, um, stronger together and helping your customer with a larger uh, range of services. That's awesome. And um, the two main things to pay attention with, uh, to pay attention uh, to, sorry. The first one is the cost for the end customer. How are you going to charge for the services? Um, can I um, buy your services and not the one from your partner? Or can I buy the services from your partner or the fitness person and not the nutritional part? And so that's something that you need to decide with your fitness partner. What are the services you're going to charge, uh, to, to uh, offer? How much are you going to charge for each services? And who is going to do what? and really put it on paper and be aligned with that. The best thing that I would do, and I've done it in, with uh, previous partners as well in, in different businesses, is that we are each of us, so you and and uh, your fitness, let's say that uh, she's uh, the one having the fitness. So you and her separately are writing down what you believe that you're going to be doing and what the other one is going to be doing the type of services you're going to be providing, how you're going to be charging, and how you see the structure. So you do that independently. Then you come together, you sit down, and you look, maybe you totally align, which I doubt, uh, and maybe uh, more realistically speaking, there are some points where you don't have the same opinion. So you start discussing that up to the point that you are totally aligned on all those elements about service, about pricing, about who's going to do what, the delivery, the structure and everything. So that's the first thing uh, that I would do to make sure that you're both aligned, because if not, you say, oh, we love each other, we're complementary, we're going to work together. And down the line, you're thinking, shoot, we should have talked about that before. So you start with that. The second thing is definitely put it on paper. What are the different responsibilities? What's gonna happen if one customer that doesn't want the, the other part of the service? Are you each getting a part of the commission because you're doing marketing and workshop together? How is it working? What's happening if you decide not to be working with each other? Those are things that I know it's never gonna happen. Well, guess what? It does happen. So those are elements that you also wanna be defining 
um, before you start doing anything officially and then have it checked by uh, a lawyer uh, i'm not saying you have to spend thousands of dollars for sure not um, so do the work together uh, with your future partner uh, in you make sure that you have the agreement make sure that you have all the points and then have it validated by uh, a legal person and then when it comes to the financial flux um, you're going to have um, a, a paypal account together separately who's going to do the, the account personally if i were you i definitely want to make sure that i have a view on the finances and, and i control the finances you never know you don't want a person just to empty the account or whatever it is or um, can they take uh, a loan or, or put the, your business in guarantee uh, it sounds weird but that could happen so those are the things that you you want to make sure cannot be happening and it's uh, clearly defined um, and having the view on this uh, PayPal account that who's doing what um, is again very important but you need to have at least a view on the finances um, ideally even to be able to uh, access uh, to do uh, some payment or wiring whatever it is and very importantly put it in your calendar especially at the beginning go into the account every day and regularly maybe every week afterwards but making sure that you are having a, a view on that that anything that you don't understand or you don't know where it's coming from that just just ask the question uh, that avoid any issue trust me okay hope it is helpful and thanks again nicole for the question i hope uh, you can start with that and uh, let us know how the partnership is going and then the last question from for today it's coming from simon martoglio martoglio uh, i hope i'm pronouncing well uh, simon the question is, can it be profitable to run a food truck business in Switzerland in the high summer season this year, this year specifically? If so, what would be the correct analysis that should be done and then the corresponding business plan? And the background for your question is that you live in a very tourist city in Switzerland. I wish you would tell us if it's Lugano or Zurich or Lausanne. Um, I would assume Lausanne for uh, the sake of the discussion and where it is also close to other highly touristy cities uh, Lausanne, Geneva, Montreux maybe uh, you have experience in food trucks and cooking meats the idea would be to make a food truck with Argentinian food different types of meat and sandwiches and other things like empanadas and hot dogs since I'm, Argent uh, I'm Argentine, Argentinian and with my family we have a butcher shop and cooking events there so the idea would be basically to copy these businesses from argentina to switzerland starting with a food truck i'm not sure you're talking about the butcher shop and cooking events in argentina or that you have it in switzerland as well in any case when you're listing meat sandwich empanadas and hot dog especially if you're from argentina you need to add mate to drink that and you need to to add alfaro alfajores con dulce de leche it's perfect and it goes very well as a dessert uh, after that now going back to your question uh, can it be profitable to run a food truck business in Switzerland in the high summer season this year so what I would look at it first is uh, how is the situation with COVID in Switzerland are things reopening uh, are people going out uh, are festival uh, reopening again uh, from what I know the uh, paleo festival uh, is not really uh, going to have uh, um, a lot of people this year but you also have the the music festival in Montreux uh, so you have a lot of events and uh, from what I know you also have a lot of uh, food truck events so um, that's somewhere to look at um, do you need a permit what is the the legal uh, aspect of it um, I believe that uh, in cities like Geneva they would probably limit the number of food truck so how do you get that permit so that's something that i would be looking at then i will look at uh in terms of the gathering what are the different events are they going to reopen where can you think of having uh, a lot of people are there tourists gonna come uh, that's the COVID situation uh today is the 8th of april talking about this summer it's in three months so um that's something that i would monitor 
is uh, the, the COVID regulation in Europe and in Switzerland, because obviously you have a lot of people in Switzerland during the summer, but you have a lot of people, as you know, coming from France, coming from Germany, coming from Belgium uh, and the other European countries uh, on holidays in Switzerland. So are they allowed to travel uh, this year? Then obviously uh, knowing your cost to run uh, the food truck, uh, how much uh, is it and all the costs that you have uh, for the permit, for the gas, for the maintenance, uh, for the staff, for the food, for the uh, different ingredients. Um, and based on that, how many, um, what is your, the revenue you need to have per day uh, on average to make sure that uh, you break even and it's profitable. So that's how I will look at it. Uh, and then I would look at um, where to test it. Um, you might not want to wait until the summer. You might look at maybe um, some uh, park, you know, the, in, in Switzerland, there's a lot of outside of the cities, the, what they call the industrial parks, where you have a, a lot of companies that are there. So maybe you can provide different meals during the day with the Argent Argentinian food. Um, I don't know about breakfast, but maybe for lunch um, and see as well uh, what type of staff you need. Because, you know, if, if you're serving lunch, you basically will have one hour, maybe 90 minutes. Uh, unless you're in France, you have four hours for this. But uh, in Switzerland, you have 90 minutes uh, to serve people. So how many people can come and that you can serve so they don't have to wait because they're not going to leave. They're not going to stay and going to go somewhere else. So that's also maybe a good way of practicing. Now, assuming that the butcher shop you're talking about and the cooking events you're talking about are happening uh, in Switzerland, uh, then those people that are coming to the butcher shop, those people are coming to the uh, cooking events, uh, maybe they have a birthday uh, that you can be uh, servicing uh, and, and bring the food truck uh, so that people go outside. And uh, especially in this COVID time, nobody has to stay inside. I know in Switzerland, it might rain, it might be cold, but uh, assuming that, that's maybe also an additional way where you can test the business model when you can test servicing people and you can also look at uh, additional revenue and then for the summer um how many trucks can you have okay i mean as you know in switzerland there's the italian region and the german speaking region the french speaking region um how many trucks can you operate uh, at once um, how many uh, staff do you need so those are additional way that i will look at uh, and last but not least, uh, especially if you're uh, talking about Argentinian food, why not reaching out to the consulate or the embassy of Argentina in Switzerland and see if they want to sponsor you uh, or uh, make sure that you also distributing some uh, of brochures about Argentina and what can be done uh, in Argentina. If especially the tourists are coming to Switzerland, maybe the next trip that they would say, next trip, uh, you will go to Ushuaia uh, or you will go to uh, visit uh, Iguazu, uh, whatever it is. Uh, those are ways that uh, you can look at to, to make your business more profitable. So I hope uh, it's helpful, uh, Simon, and uh, let us know how's the business going. So that's all the question I had for today. Um, I hope it was helpful. I'm looking forward to uh, answering your question next month. And in the meantime, if you have any question, you can reach out uh, to Sean or reach out to me. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.